Before the invasion that took place one generation ago, the southern tribes were called barbarians, and the southern realms were known as the Wastelands. Hello and welcome back to Boring Dad Gaming, where today we're going to be playing some more Road Warden. I'm going to jump straight into our save, which pretty much means immediate loading up. Um, so we've made our way to Creeks, I think it is, which is sort of in the northeast kind of the peninsula, maybe it's maybe due north. Um, in the last episode we were made to feel fairly unwelcome in um, Gale Rocks, uh, but we've, we've since helped a hunter steal a dead goat from... Uh, some sort of lizard predator, and we've arrived at their front gate. We were greeted by some naked youths, which we uh, averted our eyes from, and uh, yeah, we're about to head in and see what's going on here. The sparse clumps of grass survive only on the edges of this spacious yard. The few onlookers wear working clothes suitable for their hard labor. They're carrying tools, planks, and logs. You're next to a large building of unusual shape, either a temple or a house of gathering. It makes you think of a cabin that's been getting larger over the course of the years, with the section in the middle being darker and more crude than the outer ones. A slightly overweight man is standing in front of the building with open arms. Welcome to Creek, friend! Creek's friend! His voice and eyes are gentle, but there's vigour in his stance and gestures. Efren was meant to hunt, but I see he brought not one, but two unusual creatures. The hunter rolls his eyes. Don't embarrass us with the pr this prattle. He raises his voice and fills it with bitterness, addressing no soul in particular. And maybe ask someone to help us with his ibex. It's our shared catch. He points at you. Oh, now I want to know to whom we are grateful. Ella nods towards you. Or oh, Ela. Let's say Ela nods towards you. While I introduce myself, I observe him more closely. Being close to 30 years old, he's one of the older souls around. Just like the other villagers, he has clothes made of animals, not plants. The leather pants and jacket are humble, but the shoulder cape, reaching from his neck to elbows, used to belong to a yellow elk. His brown skin is darker than that of a farmer, and as you look at the outreached hands, they carry the marks of being cut by tools. And I'm Ela, the carpenter. He takes a step towards the fruit trees and invites you to move forward. Like most men in the village, he's cleanly shaved. How about I show you the rest of the building? It may be humble, but it's as beautiful as a blue starling. He's being friendly to us, let's be friendly to him. Thanks, Ela. That sounds lovely. As he grins, you notice his unusually white teeth. He moves with heavy but enthusiastic steps. Oh, it won't really take that long, but we have quite a view. I swear, interrupts the hunter, I'm not carrying this ibex to the kitchen. Someone call the cooks. After dropping the carcass on the ground, he springs away, fretting at the blood on his hands. Ooh, let's take a stroll in, says Ela as he leads you forward. Your mount can drink at the creek here. Come, Roach. You tether your mount to a tree next to drying laundry. Ela points at the land behind the bridge proudly. Our newest addition to the village. The hunters grow old, so we are taking steps away from meat and fruits. You spot only two people working in the field, or rather a large garden, covered with cabbages, carrots, onions and garlic, indistinguishable from the wild plants growing in the woods. On the path between the two halves of the field, an elderly woman is sitting on a stool, looking in your direction as if you're interrupting her contemplation. The old Haver there. Oh, is she talking? Uh, no, no, I think it's the guy, isn't it? Old Haver there will turn this place into a proper farm one day. She has little strength, uh, but keeps precious memories of her trade. Uh, you lack proper seeds. Oh, the good ones are expensive. Eli responds right away as if it's a part of a prepared speech. Uh, we weren't sure about our soil, it's all just a test. He invites you with a gesture to follow him deeper into the village. And there are no seas in Gale Rocks, <laughs> while the folk at Howlers won't spare their own. They'd rather force us to buy food from them. There are farmers at White Marshes, adds Ephraim, but it's a dark place. Who knows what we would reap after a year. Oh, that's rough. The bonfire spot is surrounded by logs that were cut into tables and stools. Ela approaches the nearest chair, rubbing its back with his cut hands. When we share a meal, we do so here, sometimes beneath the stars. You'd have to see it. The flames dance on the walls to the monster roars and crickets. Efren's voice also grows enthusiasm. Dining at the edge of the forest is something you wouldn't forget. Unless you can drink, don't swallow anything stronger than spoiled ibex milk. The shadow is friend. Terrifying. 
You glance over the wooden buildings. While the walls seem fine, the roofs are primitive, mostly made of planks that are already soggy and bent. There are a few people working on cleaning bark from a log, but the square is mostly quiet, with a few kids observing you from above their toys. Burning such fires must take a lot of wood. Oh, it's not something we need to worry about. Ela shows you to look around. We mostly burn what's left after sawing and construction, <laughs> gathering fuel for a few dozen days. Some of us think they can learn woodworking all by themselves, Efren says mockingly. So we waste a lot of wood. At least we can roast meat on long sticks as we sit here. Now nah, we already have results. The carpenter moves his hand from the chair to his stomach. Everything you see here, friend, was built by us and our elders. Uh, how about I showed you, show you our old forest? Is it far away? You find the answer right away. You stand between two of the houses in front of a gate of an animal pen. The walls are made of sharpened trunks and are as tall as two humans. The captured beasts are tethered by ropes but have enough freedom to wander and graze. Two brown boars and a black mouflon. And here are our captives, Efren declares proudly. I know, it's still a bit empty, but we'll crowd it just before winter. Uh, are the ropes really enough to keep them here? Can't they chew through them? Both men look at the animals with a renewed curiosity. Well, the hunter starts, if they can free themselves from a hemp rope, and then squeeze through the stakes, and why no soul sees them and then get freedom again, I'd say they deserve to do so. Ela leans against the gate and points at the area behind the palisade. The mouflon may disappear, but the boars would be stuck on this plateau. Have you noticed the old forest, friend? I look north. The vast clearing is returning to life, with shrubs spread between the paths and tree stumps. You move to the bridge, then a gateway, and have a chance to look around. We can see the edge of our world from the watchtower, Ela narrates sublimely. In the long distance, the plateau ends, surrounded by cliffs. You either John, climb up the mountains or fall to your death. Both men tell you about the difficult past of the village. A desperate camp, then a cabin, then two, shifting its wooden walls as more and more trees were cut. Without tree crowns, we can walk with no shadows, beast dens and gargoyle eyes, concludes the carpenter. Yeah, I think the second one is what more what I was thinking of. I'm surprised that the wrath of the herds hasn't smitten you yet. These pointed sticks won't stop a unicorn. <laughs> Nothing will, friend, the hunter counters, and the carpenter is eager to follow. I thank the landscape. Locking the path here was one of the first things our predecessors took care of, and it may be that the beasts don't realise how much this place has changed. He tells you there's one more thing to see and continues his tale as you walk away. From time to time, something reaches our territory. We feel safe among the bushes, but not so that we would send a child there. We have plans. So many lifetimes won't be enough to complete them. He says with a mix of melancholy and excitement, making Efren listen with attention. I want to see a stone wall with a walk for archers, weapons made of copper, a tannery set at its own camp so we're free of its stench. Farmers, fishers, sorcerers, herbalists. He returns to the main square again. Ah, the words of a dreamer. The hunter packs his companions back. First we need to learn how to feed our children. We lack strength and skill. Efren looks at you, but we have time. I frown, we never have as much time as we want. You reach the edge of the village, a cliff as tall as the wall. Beneath you, two creeks meet each other and form a gentle river. These are the trees we use to learn more about woodwork. Ela is smiling as he leans his back against the wall of a house. We plant new ones, but we'll soon have to bring wood from further away. Give the saplings a few years or however long they grow. A decade? And this is where I leave the two of you with your boring tree talk. Efren points at you. See me later if you need. I'll be around. I rarely hunt alone. The hunter watches his departing companion with genial eyes. Well, there's work to be done. A new chair awaits me. He leads you to a humble working station placed at the edge of the square. The tools you notice are very simple, if not primitive. We don't have to talk about my trade, so boring. Oh, what brings you to us? All sorts of things. Uh, let's tell him about the plague first of all, in El Pagos. He freezes, puts away his tools, and then looks at you with wide eyes. Oh, oh, wait for a bit, will you? Without waiting for your response, he springs up and knocks down a few planks as he lurches away, asking his neighbours to call the entire tribe. People surround you, asking what's going on, and once the news spreads, you answer dozens of questions, though most of what you have to say could be summed up with, I'm not sure. Aside from the worried faces, there are also more pragmatic ones. 
Hunters mention that they won't be able to deliver their autumn pelts, while one of the farmers wonders about her cousin. Oh, she was always so pier- pious, she says with an accent you remember from old Pagos. I don't know what that accent is. May the right reward her prayers or else. After some time, the crowd pays you a little attention, and Eli leads you back to his workshop. Though you know, we'll discuss this later, he says with an absent voice, and then sits down and glances at his neighbours. There's a stereo around. He halts his work and looks at you with an exaggerated frown. Well, that's a weird question. You're the first road warden I've seen in, uh, well, this season, I think. Did you check the western villages? You'll get to Howler's Dell simply staying on the road. His right hand, still holding a tool, is now squeezing his stomach gently. Um, people say Asterion spent a lot of time in your village. You're hiding something. He adjusts his shoulder cape and clears his throat with a grunt. People, I? Hmm. Well, there's some truth to that, but Asterion isn't here and we don't know where he is. He took our coins, but for fair labour. He moved wares to other settlements, patrolled the roads, escorted an old woman to a druid and back. Did you know you can get good prices for iron at Howler's Dell, but even better at White Marshes? Uh, which is interesting for us, because we're carrying a little bag of scraps at the moment. Seeing your look, he turns away and rests his elbow on his workbench. His plans are his own problem, and I've no reason to believe he wants to be found. Uh, nor can I help you. Um, ask about the bandits. He makes an awkward cut with a chisel and lets out a quiet shit. And starts to rub the back plank with his thumb. Oh, bandits, you say? Soldiers from the city have already taken care of them. Um, what about traps in an old tunnel? Do I look like someone who crawls through tunnels? <laughs> he smiles and pats his stomach. You're Ephron. He catches everything that doesn't fly or swim. I heard you have some issues with the eastern path. At first he gives you a bright smile and then nods with a sigh. Aye, aye. So our issues are so clear that folk gossip on them. I'm glad you came to our help, friend, but it doesn't feel right to admit we need help from an outsider. He stands up slowly, walks away and leaps over one of the log-made tables and looks for something in the pile of wood. In this part of the land, there's always going to be something to do for a road warden. He straights up with a piece of charred wood in his hand and gets back to you. As he draws black lines on the workbench, he mentions a few names. Creeks, foggies, gale rocks, there is the lake. The map is simplistic and doesn't align with your own understanding of local distances, but you follow his description without issues. The path from here to the south is getting too wild for us. He repine, repines, making a few more... I think it's opines. He opines, making a few, another few strokes. The merchants travel through the other route, through Howler's Dell, passing by Old Pagos and White Marshes. Once they, reach, once they reach Foggy, they already have full stomachs and many deals closed, and when they travel back, they visit the same places again. Folks already know that trading here takes a long time. So you want me to give them an option to get to you first, and move west without backtracking and do so all by myself? How exactly? Well, I'm sure you can find some help. <laughs> he pats his stomach without noticing that he leaves a few black dots on his leather jacket. There's a few things you can do. Follow the eastern road and see if it's clear. Are there any safe shelters left? Any blockades to get rid of? Is there an overgrown path to burn? Maybe see if the road from here to the western crossroads is safe, or if the carts could get through the heart of the woods, if you're brave enough. I hope you're a soul with sage judgement. Seeing your puzzled look, he rests his palms on the table with a shy smile. Uh, I, I know I'm vague, but I bet you already know more about these roads than I do, friend. His eyes return to the map, and after a moment of hesitation, he rubs the uneven line with his thumb. Uh, you forgot to mention my pay. Well, that depends on what you're about to do, I. The tribe has but a few dragons. To confirm his, confirm his words, he enters the nearby house, from which he picks up an old wooden case, crude in shape and with an unsightly engraving of a three-headed hydra on its lid. Inside it, you see maybe two dozen dragon bones. Let's say you'll get a dragon for any news about cleared or blocked areas, and more if it takes real effort from you. Yeah, okay. He flashes you a wide smile and pats his stomach. Oh, you won't regret this. He then throws away the charred wood and returns to his stool and looks for his tools. Um. Okay, we've got a couple of things we can tell him. I took a look at the dolmen in the south. It's safe. 
He keeps sculpting wood and asks you about the size and the entrance of the chapel. I've heard it's small, but not that small. Uh, not enough for a group. Oh, hang on a minute. Oh, no, there's him. Uh, but maybe a lone traveller without a mount. He looks at you with a smile. Pick a dragon bone from the case with you. I don't want to stop now. You reach towards the ugly head of a hydra. I grab a coin. Well, that's a start. Keep it up. Now, the shelter in the west isn't safe. Better to stay away from it until the dusk foxes move out. Dusk foxes? <laughs> After he meets your silence, he carries on. Oh, I don't know what that is. You describe their looks and the threat they present as Elar observes the clouds, sometimes asking you to explain more. He finally squeezes his cloak and reaches for a coin that's been resting on the workbench. Well, sounds not as dangerous as a tribe of goblins, but it might be better for us to hunt them down in spring. <laughs> we may need your help then. For now, a single dragabone will be fair pay for the news. Thanks. How much do we actually have now? Two. <laughs> okay. Well, it's something. Uh, good to see you don't idle around, Road Warden. I'll let you know if there's anything else. Uh, uh, okay, tell me about the village. Well, it isn't much older than you are. What's its story? He proudly raises a carving knife and gestures for you to look around. Oh, it may be a young village, but there's a lot to say. While his story is bloated with names, relationships, a step-by-step -step description of the growth of the settlement, and bothersome creatures, you get the gist of it. The settlers arrived here 25 years ago, soon after one of the ten cities had fallen to the southern invasion. Most of them came from the capital, while some joined them along the way. They soon came to realise that none of the villagers had enough space or the will to host a few dozen refugees. The folks at Gale Rocks used to have a much kinder attitude towards strangers than they do now, which we <laughs> have personal experience of. Um, and they offered the newcomers to stay at the beach behind their village. Yet there was nothing for them to eat other than what they caught in the salt waters. They soon started their search for a land remote enough to not compete with the locals, and with the help of kind folks from Gale Rocks, White Marshes, Old Pagos and others, uh, as Elar states vaguely, they received enough wood and tools to turn a scrap of this plateau into a clearing, and then a camp, a hamlet, and finally, a village. Fascinating stuff. The tale is assisted by walking around the village, introducing you to, to the original settlers or their offspring, and showing you some of the treasures displayed in the House of Gatherings. A unicorn's heart horn found at the heart of the woods. A blue rock that's shaped and hollow like an egg, and is darker inside. An arrow that hit a fright tape in an eye and knocked it down. Behind each of them there are names, stories and memories. At the very end, Elar leads you back to his workbench, holding a hand on his conspicuous stomach. To give his throat some rest, he turns the topic around. And what are the folks in Hoblevin like, friend? Foggy says there are thousands of souls at the capital, and one can go their entire life uh, still finding new faces in the crowd. Okay, we get to pick our response here. Uh, it may be so, but my city feels lonely. Too many, many people around, but they're too busy to share their lives with others. Um, spend time with their families and close friends, uh, close to each other, but no soul knows what happens behind closed doors. Everyone's so busy. Um, very friendly, hang out together, take baths, pray. That doesn't seem right. Hard to say, the merchants are getting richer, the priests have their games, craft guilds decide who goes in and out, and the workers have to compete. There are no monsters on the streets, at least not every day, but there is distrust in many souls. That feels like a fair response as to how I imagine the city to be. He looks at you with a sigh. Oh, I know folks go there to be safe, but what you describe, friend, sounds like a place darker than the heart of the woods. It's not if you're at the top. He adjusts his shoulder cloak and reaches for the next plank without saying anything. I imagine being a carpenter in this part of the realm isn't easy. Oh, you have a healthy imagination. He rests his elbow on the workbench and smiles. I have patience and I'm getting better with tools, and these are some shoddy tools, he says singingly. And it's hard to disagree with him. They have been used for many years, with only the wooden parts being somewhat in shape since they seem to have been recently replaced. The steel chisels and saws are jagged and dull. The hammers and axes are made of stone. Some of them were brought here by the settlers, and we can't buy any more right now. There's work to be done, but I do have a plan. You ask him to explain, and he's all too eager to do so. He enters the nearby house and shows you his more successful works, each of which has some shortcomings noticeable even to a layperson. A bowl engraved with fish was poorly planned, and animals too large to fit into the centre space, entire space, and so a part of it is blank. 
A simple relief of two naked people in their embrace looks almost believable, but the legs are in one case too long and in the other too short. One chair has a broken leg and the remaining three show that they are a bit too ambitiously shaped and got dangerously thin. The chest seems fine, but equipment sticks out of it and the, main, the man acknowledges that he wrongly estimated the required size. Uh, so you want to be an artist? Better. I want to turn pots, cups, weapons, cupboards, everyday th stuff into things of beauty. Seeing your look, he pats his stomach. I know I'm far from mastering it, but trust me, these are so much better than the ones I did this winter, and I started only three years ago. His pride makes him look even larger, especially in the shoulders. There aren't many carpenters in the peninsula. Folk do things for their own use, but I'll be a specialist. It's the city thing. Foggy told me so. Not just a jointer, but someone who does only a few things, uh, but better than others. The tribe supports me with food and time, and I'll pay them back with dragon bones and prettier houses. When he leads you outside, you start to share some of his excitement, but most of it dwindles away after you sit down at his workbench again, on wobbly stools surrounded by broken planks and crude tools. I think we'll say goodbye to him for the Elar for now. Uh, Roach is observing the monkeys moving on the surface of the rock face, swinging its tail. Um, I'm going to go to the creek. I wonder if I might be able to bathe. With the calming sounds of the waterfall around you, you observe the stream as clean as a spring. The oak ash soap and the teeth set you own can help you get cleaner. Uh, let's do it. There we go. We're fairly presentable again. There are no fish or plants to bother you with, and uh, to bother with, and your feet find mud amongst the not always smooth pebbles. The water reaches above your waist, allowing you to have some fun and wash every spot of your shell. Thanks to the gentle flow, you're able to remove the mud stains from your clothes and boots. Step away. Um, maybe there are some locals looking for a match in other villages. A few minutes after a few minutes, you find yourself sitting at a table with Shoshi, a dark-haired twenty-year-old who uh, some call a woodcutter, others a singer. In both these roles, her massive stature must be of help. When she walks, she either carries a large axe on her shoulders or swings it around, towering over her tribesfolk like a chieftain from the tales of war. She admits she enjoys a friendly shag from time to time, but can't see a future for her in creeks. In other these friends lose their lives in the wilderness. I start seeing cats and gargoyles in every shadow. I'd rather have a calm, safe years, few calm, safe years at the side of a pretty little woman whom I'll see in my bed in the evenings. Though you know, friend, not just her. Ha <laughs> ha. She lets out sonorous laughter. You mention that you don't know if she'll be able to keep her trade after moving away, and she strokes her axe with affection. Oh, I'd miss these woods, but who knows? My tribe can't be the only one that cuts trees around here, I. You try to ask her about her worldview, but she gets bored by the topic. We here, she looks around, we have no temples and priests, and I don't aim to become one. Uh, I tell her about Marina from Gale Rocks. Well, well, you've quite found quite someone, friend, and I've heard a lot of good things about her home. But this right talk makes me worried. Are you sure she'd be ready to keep our bonds loose? Seeing your shrug, she sighs. Uh, tell her about me. Don't hide my plans. Just speak of me kindly. She laughs. If she wants to have fun with me, I'll make her life warmer, and I love kids. For the first time, her smile becomes humble and kind instead of playful. Farewell. Go talk to the farmer. You follow the path between the fields, witnessing a one-sided conversation between old Haver and a barely adult man. She orders him around, pointing at various plants, criticising the sight of weeds and addressing the fancy clothes he's wearing. He, obser he observes his red-dyed boots and lets out a relieved sigh after your arrival. I better change, he mumbles, heading to the main square. I step out of his way. The woman spares you a wry glance and then turns away, focused on the struggling vegetables. She's the only person in the village who wears clothes made of plant fabric, but they're weathered and covered with decades-old patches. Her hands, clasped behind her back, are constantly twitching. Could be friendly, ask how she's doing, see what she's got for sale. Um... I think we'll be friendly. Um, I don't really want to buy anything just now. I've only just got two coins. Uh, after a moment, she turns to you slowly, chewing her bottom lip. I am doing my break. Say what you want and fast. I mean, we could see what she's got for sale. Um, I don't know if we'll be resting here. I feel like we should be moving on. Um, let's see what she's got. There we sold what we had. We're lacking hunters. And these... She looks at the wrinkled vegetables. We'll go into a stew if they're even worth picking. 
Without noticing it, she grabs her left forearm with her right hand, but it doesn't stop the twitching. We always have a fish trap to spare. We make them just in case. Uh, we know what uh, they are. I'm not going to do the whole description. And if you'd rather eat something right away, she carries on after a short pause. Our cooks would spare you a roast grouse or a chicken. It'll be cold, but fresh. We always have one. You never know when there are maggots in your supplies and kids shouldn't skip a meal. You ask her to tell you more, but her patience grows thin. It's the best light roast in the north. We add plenty of spices to it, so it spoils slowly. That's it. Um, okay, fine. Show me how it works. A spiced whole meal cooked with care. That might be nice. I don't need the fish trap. Uh, we've got one, albeit currently way in the south. I don't need earplugs because I can make my own. I don't expect many merchants to reach this place. Why don't you move your traps to Foggies? Oh, what's it to you? She doesn't wait for your response. Does does her yard look like it has space for nets? Um, I'm looking for a place to sleep. Oh, we need another hut and we've no space for it. She gazes at you with dry, tired eyes. If you need a scrap of floor, go to the tavern. We'll ask about the earplugs, but I'm, we've got one anyway. But her fault shoulders flinch. But will that work? They can break the skull of a deaf shell. After you shrug, she looks at one of the farmers who's wearing mouflon fur. Oh, give me something good to eat. I'll give you a few tufts of thick wool. Put them in your ears and then wear them under a tight hood. I'll think about it, because I can actually make them... If I go into my inventory, what can I make them out of? No, I could. Oh, what was it made of before? Stuff a chicken in my ears. Um, I don't know. Um, I know we had the option before. I'm. Ah, I'm not going to spend my coin on it. It's fine. Talk to the hunter. He's lost in his thoughts. What sort of traps would you put in an old tunnel? Uh, it depends. He draws. Got anyone to help you? Let's start with taking a good look around. You find some sticks, tools, maybe the beast tusks. This long. He shows a span with his fingers. Or bigger! What's your catch? You mention the skeletons and he scratches the side of his hat, grunting. Oh, then, then, then. Oh, a bit fast, eh? Put something fast too, but firm, but hitting right away. B but camouflage, but, um... He sees your frown and straightens up. Well, let's say you can find any wood. Put deadfalls where you can gather hard things to drop, maybe above doors, and whip traps behind turns and corners. Oh, but these take a lot of work. Foothold traps are easy to make... But if the tunnel is rocky... Oh, lazy spirits, just come with me. You take a short walk to the woods and he shows you a few spots with traps for animal feet, made of short slats surrounding camouflaged holes, and tells you how to place some larger traps without having trees around. You head back to the village and you repeat his instructions. Um, okay, we can talk about the foragers catching a big runner. Uh, that was around day 30, wasn't it? We've got a few days still. How, do, how would you approach this? Ah, oh, so that's their scheme, huh? He looks in the tavern's direction, pausing for a moment, and straightens up. Now, nah, so you're seeking advice from a more experienced hunter. He pats his club proudly. Well, there's the usual stuff. Don't fight hungry. Have a decent jacket. Be sure to have something to block a bird's charge. No, oh, and maybe... He points to the sky, then stretches out his arms as if holding a long stick. A spear! The longer you keep a runner at distance, the better. Why don't you help the foragers? Well, they didn't ask any of our tribes, folks, so I guess we're not welcome. I thought they'd realise they weren't fit to be hunters. Ilan's a bit of a sissy and zvi. He takes a longer pause. We'd have a hard time finding, any, finding anyone to hunt with. It's a matter of trust, you see. Are you the only hunter around? No, of course not. There's, um... He takes a suspiciously long time. Seven of us, yeah. The tribe's small. We have enough food with our daily trips. If we catch, catch too much meat, it spoils, so it's better to let the animals feel safe. He tried to change the topic, but the man suddenly looks around and lowers his wolf's head. Well, there's 
One issue, um, three of my friends left the village a few days ago and they haven't returned yet, but they should. Ela's grown worried. Are they the ones we saw with the broken down cart? It's possible. Although they came, did they not say, no, they said they came from White Marshes, didn't they? He walks around from time to time looking at you with an open mouth, not sure how to start. He takes off his heavy cloak and looks you in the eye. Uh, they left for a few days to seek and kill some big game, each of them a different one, and then bring all of them for me to judge. His confident voice falters when he mentions his own part. The winner would have called me the prey of the greatest size, rarity and utility, and of the greatest threat. He turns away and lowers the wolf's mouth. Tell me more about them. Uh, they're hunters and fighters, but also close friends. If one of them was in trouble, the others would have done all they could to help. They've been a team for years and were planning to start a family this winter, you know? The last big adventure before Dahlia's belly locks are at home. It gives you quite a tale of their deeds and features. Dahlia is the bravest of them with strong legs. She has simple ways and looks for beasts in the open by the roads. Her hair is light, always tied in a single braid. Admon is a man who seeks paths and challenges. He believes that seeking knowledge of the peninsula will bring the tribe ways to survive hardships. He was is smaller than the others and knows more about dressing the wild game than any of them. His arms are small, so he often places traps. His hair is a bit darker than Dahlia's, but short, just like his beard. Vashel is not a man, though they were... Oh, God. Though they were born with a prick, apparently, and wears browns and greens to blend in with the trees. They hunt like a gargoyle, hiding among leaves, jumping at a creature when it gets close. Because of that, they have often roamed in the woods, even the, those that are far away from the village. Uh, this sounds serious, but if you want me to look for them, I'm going to need a reward. Isn't helping three young, strong souls enough? Seeing your look, he raises his voice, draws his obsidian-edged club and touches his chest with it. Then I will loyally assist you, friend. For your brave deeds, you may count on me on a day of great challenge. As he lowers his weapon, he winks at you, and others will be grateful as well, you know that. Uh, where should I start? He looks at you as if you're slow. I would have found them myself if I knew, eh? Let the horse take you to other settlements. Ask there. Let's say I know where to find them. What should I tell them? Have you no shred of optimism? Maybe they're fine. Just tell them to come home. We've got enough wood and food to start the next feast. And I have a hint that an honourable guest may be welcome there. He smiles at you, and for a moment you think you see the wolf's head wink. I'll tell you if I find any. What do you know about the road running through the heart of the forest? I know to avoid it. Blood there. Seeing, you're th seeing that you're waiting for a longer tale, he adjusts his heavy cloak, spending a good minute on making sure that you understand it's a dangerous place. You'll do better riding around it. The northern road is the safest, he concludes. After you insist that any sort of guidance may be of use, he scratches the wolf's head. I've heard from a friend that gnolls were moving there. Those very small beast folks, you know. He moves an open hand close to his hips, portraying the height. They'll threaten you until you give them some meat, and that's all they eat. No fruits, no, I don't know, bones. But it's the fright apes that scare me the what the fright apes that scare me the most. There's an entire family of them. Trust me, if you ever hear the terrible scream of a human somewhere in the tree crowns, run as fast as you can. Don't seek it and certainly don't fight it. Just run as fast as you can. That's interesting, because we did find that. We had exactly that, didn't we? Uh, a human screaming in the, in the forest. And because we were basically completely dead at that point, um, we did actually leave them. And I, I, you know, I just felt that it probably was something like that. Uh, like a monster mocking human speech. And that seems to confirm it. So we, we did make the right decision there. Uh, so have a good hunting. Uh, that's pretty much all our, all our choices now. So... We've got eight and a half hours before dusk. Let's have a look at our travel options. So we are here at Creeks. That's Foggy Lake. We can go south from here. I think that leads to the heart of the woods. Um, we've got Gale Rocks. So that's two hours. I was thinking of getting all the way back to... Maybe go to White Marshes and sell our stuff. And then return to Howler's Dell and do a few bits around there. 
That's kind of what I was thinking of. We're going to not go to Old Pagos. So to get to Howler's Dell, it's uh, 4 hours 45, so that's most of our time. But I think we have probably got time to go to Gale Rocks first. Which is the tunnel that I... Which is the tunnel that I uh, explored? Is it this one? We know how to set traps now. Um, okay, well let's go. Let's start off by going, returning to Gale Rocks because we can talk to Marina about the uh, Shashi or whatever her name was. I go to. Marina, wasn't it? I tell Marina what I've learned about Shoshi from the Creeks. She looks around nervously and her voice is low and hesitant. An open relationship, as if, um... Seeing her blush, you nod. Our forebears wouldn't encourage such a way of living. Does she pray? When you mention that her village in general seems to not put much importance on matters of faith, she seems to lose hope. Oh, is she pretty at all? She says without meeting her eyes. You try to answer some more specific questions, making her interest suddenly grow. Oh, she's really looking for a safe, slow days. Ask her if she's willing to abandon this weird wish. Tell her... She pauses, then straightens up and speaks with confidence, as if she's reciting an old story. Tell her this, outsider. You can find love of soul and shell with me, and a new path free of empty cravings. You won't ever look back and regret it. So if she's willing to actually settle down, she can do that. Um, we'll probably leave now. Six and a half hours. So I think we go to the peat fields. We get this guy to open up that again. We'll head to White Marshes and sell our scrap. Um, we're probably running out of time a bit. Uh, six and a half hours. Did we have somewhere to sleep in White Marshes? I can't remember. We could just head down to Howler's Dell instead. Have a more comfortable night. And... Um, maybe do white marshes on the way back north because I do want to sort of press on here I want to try the road south through what I think is probably the forest um, but yeah let's head out back to Howler's Dell for now you approach the opening gate and then carefully dismount a guard approaches you ready to take your mount to a stable greeting road warden what news do you bring we gossip for a bit the curious locals gather around to take part in your conversation recently a massive beast has tried to make a lair amongst the hemp fields it may be time to form a night watch. I enter the village. The stable master shows up soon after you step away from Roach. His lips are thinned and he gives a longing glance towards the bridge. Um, hey, water and peace, please. I'm broke. He scowls at you but points at an empty bucket and steps away. I fill the trough with water from the creek and make sure Roach is comfortable. Uh, it's Who, what did I need the washerwoman for? I can't remember. Oh, yes. Uh, she's at the creek, but takes a break to speak with you, apologising for her crude appearance. She gasps for air with her hands on her knees, but looks you directly in the eyes. I tell her about Paulus from Gale Rocks. Sounds like a worker, but make sure he will near oppose the marriage rites. His village follows the rite. I'll need his word he'll leave his spirit behind him. If he agrees... Her teeth are yellowish, but healthy. He can come in fall. We'll see how we get along. See you soon. Uh, you're wandering through the village. Two men in light clothing are carrying a wooden log, insulting each other in friendly banter. A woman and a young boy are sitting on a bench as she shows him how to weave a basket. What's the tailor got going on? No. Main square. It's getting dark and the inn is loud and crowded. The innkeeper lights up the rush lights, the workers drink, and the guards are preparing for the night watch. If it wasn't for the presence of the creek and the uncanny lack of beggars, this place would feel like Hovlevin's marketplace. One of the tables is occupied by a dozen or so kids. None of them looks older than twelve, and the youngest one, too dirty to resemble either a boy or a girl, is about six. They are surrounded by their playthings, a mouflon on wheels, an elegant wooden sword, and a painted board covered with rocks, but they are bored and tired. Even though you only get a glimpse of them, the oldest girl notices your attention. 
She springs up to her feet and approaches you with a few skips. She's already pretty tall, dressed in a worn, subdued tunic, so long that it looks like a sack. Um, yeah, let's not encourage her. She puts her hands together and puts on a grimace of playful misery. Master Road Warden, here in such... Oh, Master Road Warden. Hearing such an antiquated salutation makes it difficult for you to hide your smirk. We are... we here. She points at her group. Bored! Oh, so bored! She puts the back of her hand on her forehead, letting out a deep sigh. Please, Master, tell us a story or two, for each traveller sees with different eyes. The last few words sounds like an echo of an old tale. Fine, make room for me at the table. The children gather round and ask you for a minute for them to gather their friends and siblings. After a bit of chaos, there's twenty young souls sitting closely to one another, one another on benches, stools and on the ground. The red-haired twins brought a blanket to lay down on. You have a shorter side of the table all to yourself. The older kids understand your lost look in an instant. They start to hush each other, which causes an even greater amount of noise. But in the end, there are dozens of eyes staring at you with a mixture of boredom and anticipation. I tell them a story from my church, which is probably not what they're looking for. One of my adventures as it happened. Uh, one of our adventures I'd spice it up with a couple of small lies. Or tell them about Hovlevan. Um, our adventures to date are not terribly exciting, so let's spice it up with a couple of small lies. The story takes quite a bit of time and at one point gets a bit cruel. The uh, youngest kid covers their eyes, which doesn't block their hearing in any way. As you get to the end, the tension disappears. The older kids clap for a bit, keeping their dignity intact, while the younger ones start to laugh and argue, la argue loudly about the best part of your tale. For some reason, two of the girls start to wrestle, pretending to be two of the characters that you just portrayed. Seeing this, the adults decide to intervene. You stand up and the children do the same to show their respect. The girl that had previously talked with you thanks you for your time. It was my pleasure. Um... It is basically dusk, but let's look for the, ask, look for the mayor first. <laughs> the guard informs you that the mayor is currently busy, but he'll mention to her that you're waiting. You sit on a bench and wait for quite a while, so what's that done to dusk time? It is dusk. When Tys joins you, she apologises for the wait. Welcome back to our village, Sir Bo uh, She was Scottish, wasn't she? Welcome back to our village, Sir Boring. You wanted to see me. I show her the trollbone tablet. Can you tell me what's here? Pretty. She taps the carving on the back. Are you sure you don't want to leave it with a... Are you sure you don't want to leave it with a cake kiosk for a few bones? She glances at the letters, then puts the tablet on the table. Oh, it's just some farewell letter, written to Valance. His husband says he couldn't stand this nightmarish village and that he met someone else during his hunting trip. It ends with a, we will start a new family, goodbye. No signature. Um, Brings sad news from old Pagos about the plague. For a few breaths, she doesn't even blink. So close to us, a plague. How? She adjusts her cape and calls for a guard with a gesture. Tell the others to gather by ape ale, she tells her, then looks back into your eyes. I'll pass them the news once we're done here. We have to close the gates, maybe keep strangers away. She starts to tap on her deer buckle. At least we can make some preparations thanks to you. Good wardening, she says with little conviction. But you should also speak with our druids. They may have more questions for you. The guard returns and the mayor sends her away again. Warn Elpis. She must speak with Sir Boring soon. I could use some work. She sighs with relief and follows a gestures for you to follow her to the creek. The light dancing on its surface and you can't miss the fact that its humming conveniently camouflages the mayor's voice. I've a perfect task for someone of your trade. Behind our northern gate you'll find a road. It leads to a coastal beach that used to be occupied by our fishers. Hit by a cold gust of wind, she adjusts her cape, covering her neck. That hamlet allowed us to watch the sea, and every ten days we had as many fish and crabs as we desired, without the grace of the villages in the north. She looks into your eyes. However, an earthquake led to a rock slide and has made the road impassable. We weren't ready to clear it, and now, almost a decade later, the route is too unknown for us to risk long journeys. She raises an arm, trying to place it around your shoulders. Uh, we can allow that. Her hat, gentle hand is as light as a leaf. The druids have convinced my people to accept the way it is. The will of the wilderness. She smells of roses. But enough time has passed. The roads grow desolate and we need to put our trust in ourselves. Help me clear the pass and my neighbours will follow us. If not because of their ideals, then because of their stomachs. 
As she steps away, her fingers stroke your neck gently. The more time we spend on the road, the more monsters monsters will hunt us. With your palfrey, you can save us from danger. Let me retrieve the hamlet. Help me retrieve the hamlet, and you'll prove to me that you're a friend of Howler's Dell. Start by riding to the Buried Pass. See if there's any lairs there that would need our interference. You're asking a lot for a scrap of parchment. Oh, but there will be coin, of course. Laughing, she returns to her chair. Five for helping us clear the path. Pass. Five for letting me know what you've learned about the hamlet. Another three if you have to fight in any of these places. For a day or two work? Oh, that's more than fair. I've already been to the collapsed mountain pass. She rests her chin on the back of her hand and listens, listens patiently to your story and taps on the table once you mention the buried rags. Well, none of us were there on the day of the earthquake. And whatever corpses may be there, they've surely been awoken by the fox by now. She straightens up. It's still better than a wyvern or a lair of harpies. The plan stays the same. You'll take 20 diggers and guards and escort them to the rock slide. Your job is to keep them alive and well. She looks at the sky. It may take many hours, maybe even an entire day, so you should start in the morning. You get the first share of your payment once you clear the path. I'm going to take care of it soon. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, I think we should speak to the innkeeper and rest for the night. We've only got one uh, coin, haven't we? As far as I remember. So I don't know if that's going to get us a good night's sleep. Uh, Eric's, we could ask him about the missing hunters. He rubs his neck and looks at the clouds. Oh, we recognise those names, but I've seen they foals, folks from creeks in a long time. They come here before and after the winter to trade for grains. Thanks. Uh, well, we can actually sleep from our main menu, so let's do that. Um, let's sleep on the pelt, but I'm going to use my ritual to restore some health. Fortunately, I can't do a lot. Um, because I have no money, really. Um, but let's sleep on the pelt. Hopefully get to half health, I think. I hope. The rains once again hit the ground, interrupting your sleep. Another day of muddy roads. <sighs> it's a calm, warm night. As your first sleep ends, you stretch out and prepare yourself for an active hour or two. It's time to take care of some things that must be done at least once every few days, though they're a bit more challenging than your nightly routine. I gather my amulets and focus on my breath, practicing how the pneuma flows through my shell. Hopefully it'll heal me a bit. There we go. This is the healthiest we've been for days. Uh, it's warm here, but the mouflon skin allows your back to rest a bit. You wake a couple of times during the night. The smell of the cook's jewel fuel fuels your hunger, and the staff returns to the room once every hour or so to stir the pot. Uh, you wake up early, but leave the building to check up on Roach and give it water from the creek. The innkeeper is sitting near the door, from time to time carrying another, out another bowl with either stew or gruel. Tice is nowhere to be seen. Yeah, let's leave the square for now. Um, I've got to go and see the druids. Maybe we'll do that now. This time, the tall druid gives you an encouraging nod. Even though he remains on the bench, he's huge. He would do well as a guard at a city alehouse. I'll walk further south to the spot where the new building is being built. I think it's probably there. You approach the building site. The stone foundations are finished, and the timber frame is jointed together with a set of intriguing cuts, like a large toy. One day their walls will be whitewashed with limestone and turned into a prestigious shelter, unlike the houses made of logs and boards. The other buildings are surrounded by grass, flowers and herbs. The turmoil of village life is drowned out by the sound of the creek, but the knocking of a hammer shatters this tranquility. The builders give you curious looks from above the log they're cutting. Now we'll pass them and head to the druids. You're welcomed by eight elders gathered in a semicircle, watching your steps closely. They're not as large as the workers, and their clothes are far from humble. Instead of hemp pants or tunics, they wear colourful robes and dresses made of wool. They vary in style, length and embellishment, separating them from the outfits of monks. You spot belts and cords, sandals and closed shoes. One person is bald, one has silver hair long enough to cover the, her back like a cape. Most of the druids are clean and rested, though only one is a bit of a sloven, with uncombed hair, stained clothes and dusty feet. Also, unlike priests of Hovleven, their hands are marked by scars, hard skin, old burns and missing fingers. Still in silence, a woman with a staff steps forward. 
I take a closer look at her. Her grey robe is decorated with a brown thread that portrays leaves, tree branches and birds. She's over 50, but the youngest one of them all. Her back is straight, the grey hair only an inch long. She doesn't need a walking stick. Her weapon is smooth, longer than she is tall. Her blue eyes are vigilant and keenly observe your face as if in search of venom in your nose and lips. Her lips are thin and small, formed into an austere line that shakes slightly as if she's on the brink of a burst of anger. She says nothing. Okay, we could be friendly. We could be neutral. We could be intimidating. We could be jo jokey. We could be sad. But t to be honest, that's actually not a bad choice because they're uh, bowing her head and wait for her to speak first. I think that might be the best approach. After many long breaths, she moves closer, her steps and smile gentle. She smells of fresh thyme, but there's an unfamiliar hint to it. Her free fingers reach for your chest, but don't touch it. Let me see your face, traveller. You straighten up. Her smile is polite and vague, but her eyes, which now seem a bit brighter than they were just a moment ago, are warm. Your arrival is welcomed by us, ever though the arrival may open the flood of change. Share with us your thoughts, and we'll share ours with you. Her words are slow and soft, as if she's delighted by their taste. Tyus thinks you should know about the plague that has fallen upon old Pagos. You tell her what you've learned at the village gates, making her lean on her staff, touching it with her cheek. We cannot help with this tragedy. The people of old Pagos are not our friends, and we will not risk our lives for theirs. She turns towards the rest of her gathering. After their nod, she takes a deep breath. As she speaks, she looks at the ground. Travels south to the great healer who lives in a caves beyond the beholder, the spirit that guides us through the swamps. Only he may find a way. And we know have we met him, have we not? See the guy, the old guy, who's living in the abandoned mine all by himself. Thanks. I'll, I'll see what he has to say. Um, I'm looking for a healer. <laughs> she raises her head bit and observes you in silence. You will not find them here. My soul has its limits. I need to be there when an elder falls down the stairs, when a child gets a fever, when a lumberjack cuts off their arm. We don't need your dragon bones and I will not put a stranger above my neighbours. Hmm. Have you ever met a Asterion? No. Seeing that you wait for a more detailed answer, she taps her fingers on her staff. We had no reason to talk with him. your stance on necromancy. She grabs her staff with both hands. The awoken spirit, the, sorry, the awoken spit onto the order of things, on time and nature. When held by human spells, they only grow, waiting for the pneuma of corruption to cover their bones. Their will is simple and will never be forgotten. They will hunt for those we care for, and they will drink their blood. Her face hides any emotion. Her voice is monotonous, but her fingers are getting pale. The curse of necromancy does not enter our gathering. Um, what are your thoughts on negotiations with the Merchants Guild? She looks towards your axe and clamps her hand over her staff with new strength. We are not the ones to tell our village how to act or how to think. If they decide to follow their mayor, we will follow. She lowers her voice and her gaze is like a storm. When a bear enters your house, you don't scream at it, nor hold the door for it to leave. You wait or throw it a fish. But if it heads to the bed of your child, you jump on its back, even if you have, have all you have are your teeth. For a single heartbeat, you see a red line in her eye. All right, I think that's enough for the druids. Got some good info, though, to go and seek out that healer. Might be what we do next. Um... Was that Elpis? I think it probably was, wasn't it? Um, I want to wait for the trader. I want to sell my stuff to him. Let's wait for him at a table. That'll do. You hear Akakios' voice. Here to see me. Oh, just a minute. I usually start a bit later. The man walks by you and goes behind the counter, where he starts to unpack and inspect his wares. Speak while I'm young. Um, I bring goods to sell. Surprise me. Iron scraps. Ooh. Now oh, we can always use some iron, but these scraps are one rain away from getting trashed. See, this one's already rusty. You won't get more than seven rings for that, deal? 
deal. Uh, we've got another one of those. Same deal. So we, ooh, that was quite... Ooh. What have we got now? We've got 15 coins, so we're rich. Wow. We're probably not rich. We're the richest we've been. Uh, what about <laughs> sell that old man's Dear John letter? For two rings? Uh, no. We, if we come across him again, we should uh, probably tell him what it says. Um... I can't remember where he was there. It's probably in our journal. Let's have a look. Um, oh, quests. Here we go. Uh, read the letter. There we go. A man from White Marshes. Okay. That's fine. No worries. We will return there uh, soon. At some point. That's good. I'm more pleased. With Actually, what has he got to buy? New battle axe for all our money. I don't know about that. We could try and invest in the linen sheets and maybe maybe make money on that exchange. And we may do that, but I think because I'm gonna hmm, I think because I'm gonna head up and do that tunnel stuff next. That I won't do that. We need to eat though. I wonder if we can um, buy some food. For two coins, we could have. fill our stomach and have a nice bath. That might be nice. Ooh, look at that. You don't keep track of, track of time, easing your soul with warm water and whiffs of oil. You are served a warm mutton stew and a cold yogurt while the youngsters wash your clothes in the stream. After an hour, you return to Eric's. I think that was worth uh, worth a couple of coins. A nice full tum. I'm feeling, I mean, in terms of our stats, I'm feeling the best I've felt for a, a few episodes, a couple of in-game days, say. Um, but I think it's probably time to go and uh, deal with the rock slide. Or shall I go south and deal with the plague first? I mean, the, the rock slide's been there for ten years, hasn't it? It's only an hour to there. You know, I will do that, but I think we'll do it in the next episode. I think we'll leave it there. It feels like we've done a bit. We've explored um, creeks, is what it was called, wasn't it? We've come down and sold some of our scraps and made a bit of money for the first time. We've healed a bit, which is quite nice. So, yeah, I feel like we're doing, doing fairly well. We've got a potential lead to perhaps cure the plague that's troubling old Pagos. That'd be quite nice. Um, so yeah, so lots to look forward to in the next episode. Um, and I hope to see you then. Uh, but I'll say, uh, I hope you enjoyed this. I'm still very much enjoying playing it, so I hope you're still enjoying watching it. Uh, if you are, then uh, please hit the like button on the video and subscribe to the channel as well. That'd be fantastic. And in the meantime, meantime, I hope to see you next time for more Road Warden. Bye for now.